Hello everyone, welcome to the Growing Chickpeas in 2019 webinar. My name is Prue Cook, I work with the Birch of Cropping Group and I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. Now um, my fellow presenters have advised me that I'm having some occasional audio challenges today which is um, unfortunately the joys of joining in from uh, regional Australia. Uh, so I will try and talk as little as possible but my apologies if my audio is challenging for you today. Um, now just to give you a quick background, this project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability opportunities. The purpose of today's webinar is to give new and existing chickpea growers a snappy overview of what to consider this season to best set you up for success. Now just before we start, some quick housekeeping on how to use the webinar software. I've muted everyone's microphones. Please keep these on mute so that we can minimise background noise and not distract the presenters. We'll have a Q&A at the end of today's session, but please feel free to submit questions any time. You can do this by looking for a speech bubble icon. It should be at the bottom of your screen, but it will look a little bit different depending on which device you're joining us from. If you click that, you can then send a message either to everyone or you can send it to Birchip Cropping Group for your question to be submitted anonymously. Now this webinar is being recorded. If you can't stay for the whole thing or if there are any technical issues, um, my contact details will be available at the end of the webinar. So you can email me to request a copy or they'll be made available on GRDC's website next week. Now just to quickly help our presenters and get a gauge on who's joining us today, I've got two quick questions that I'd like to ask you all. Hopefully you should see popping up on your screen two questions. One in relation to your experience with chickpea growing and another about where your location is. I'll just give you a couple of quick minutes to type those in or hit the correct buttons. If you can't see those, don't worry about it. You get to sit quietly for a moment, but this will just help our presenters understand who's online today. While you're doing that, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Now here we've got we've got a, a lot of miscellaneous people joining us today. A couple of agronomists, um, a couple of people from the Lower EP, York and Mid North, a couple from Wimmera and Central Vic, a couple from Central Victoria slash SA in the high rainfall zone there, and we've got a few from outside the GRDC southern region as well too. I'll leave that poll open for a little bit longer just so we can collect some of those results from where you're from. But what I would like to do is introduce our first presenter. Now our first presenter for today is Jason Brand. And Dr Jason Brand is with Agriculture Victoria based in Horsham where he heads up the GRDC Southern Pulse Agronomy Program and has over 20 years experience in the pulse industry. Jason, I am going to... Turn your microphone on for you when I can find the correct button. Are you there, Jason? Certainly am. Beautiful. Can you hear me loudly? Okay, talking about chickpeas as we go to the first slide. Uh, so, um, as we all know, last year was a pretty tough season, and uh, on this opening slide, it just gives you an overview of uh, like the trial site we had, which covered a whole range of pulse crops, obviously, down at Horsham. Uh, and then just a nice little photo there of some chickpeas up here, up at Oyam. Um, surprisingly, chickpeas probably did as well for us up at Oyam, which is our low rainfall zone site, as they did anywhere last year. There was a little bit of rain in October, which the chickpeas were able to pick up on um, after all the lovely frosts that we had. And uh, we did get a few pods and a bit of yield up there at the end of the day. So let's move on to the next slide. A couple of... Um, surprising things for us last year in terms of the trial season was just the fact that uh, we got a lot more disease in our trials than we were expecting and 
obviously we do spread inoculated stubble because we're trying to um, <coughs> assess, we'll jump one ahead there, thanks. Um, we'll go back again. But yeah, we get a lot of, uh, you know, we're trying to encourage disease out there. But to one of the interesting lessons was, was that uh, down in Horsham, we actually pre or irrigated up some early sown treatments. And uh, that was sown in uh, mid late April. And we only put about 10 mil equivalent rainfall on those particular plots. It was early sown, we were looking at different maturity groupings in chickpeas and just looking at that sowing date question. Uh, that actually caught us off guard big time. They got out of the ground, got growing, got a fair bit of biomass into them. And then suddenly went out there one day and they had ascochyta blight in them when I wasn't necessarily expecting much because we really hadn't had any rain. There wasn't a lot of dew at night, but there was certainly biomass happening. We hadn't spread any inoculum at this time, but we certainly had uh, ascochyta coming pretty quick in those trials. And we ended up having to um, switch to some other new chemistry to um, try and hold the disease up and spray regularly to actually uh, pull it back in those trials because we had some susceptible lines in there, uh, unfortunately. So it was a bit of a surprise for us what the ASCO was. Obviously in the industry there wasn't a lot around, but um, <clears throat> yeah, for us in trial work it was um, a lot more than expected. And then obviously when we weren't able to control the disease as much, we were certainly getting a lot of ascochyta blight on the pod. So that's going to lead into some interesting trial work this year with the seed collected from those particular trials. Next slide, please. As I've highlighted in previous uh, webinars, uh, last year, pretty much the dry and the frost were key uh, overriding factors. So uh, the photo on the left there is actually from our Wimmera site, and that's probably one of our better chickpea plots. Uh, you know, and uh, that had had a bit of disease through it, but. Um, yeah, just really poor growth all season, uh, low rainfall, um, just just a real struggle uh, all in all. So uh, it was, yeah, just a tough season for chickpeas. And then if we look on the other side with the frost, <coughs> you can see an image there of frosted grain uh, just coming from some of our plots. Uh, this is actually from Horsham, uh, some harvested samples and just the amount of uh, small seed that we actually had. And the photo down the bottom is those lovely air pods you get in chickpeas when they get frosted during the potting phase. Uh, and you know, when we reflect on some of the trials, even up at Odin, there were some lines that were flowering relatively early and the poor lines, they just kept getting hit by frost. And you know, we just left, lost row after row of flowers and um, row after row of pods as well. So it was a pretty tough season all round um, across all trial sites for me last year. Next slide, please. So despite those conditions, uh, yields were actually okay considering the, the low, low rainfall year. So at OEM, we actually got up to about 1.2 tonnes per hectare on some of the latest sown chickpeas that just happened to lack a little bit of rain later in the season. So it's quite amazing what they were able to produce given the rainfall we had. Cario, that was just a really dry year. Um, so we had a tough season up there and now at low rainfall zone. And then Horsham, yeah, 0.2 to 0.7 tonnes per hectare. So low yields through the Wimmera, certainly nowhere near what we want. Prices were, you know, I think generally on average, we'll talk a bit more about them later on. And, uh, you know, as, as I hear highlighted before for growers, you know, generally low disease pressure. Uh, and obviously given the season mixed grain quality. So, that's a quick snapshot for me, so next slide please. I always like to highlight um, just the long term trends. So if we look uh, on the far right hand side of that table there, you can look at the chickpea returns at my Mallee sites from over the last few years, from 2012 at Cario and 2015 at Oyen. And obviously there's a huge amount of variation there because prices and yields jump around a fair bit. Uh, what the data is there, it's based on the average yield for the site and then uh, the price in December or January that season. So, and, and then I just take off a rough production cost of around that $300 to $350 a tonne. So to give you an idea of the returns or you know the gross margins that could be estimated, 
uh, for those particular regions. And if uh, we click on the next slide, you'll see that the long-term averages stack up quite well for chickpeas in those environments. And, and I guess that's the thing is if we're out of the game when we have a good season, you miss out big time. Um, obviously, we're in the game when we have a bad season, you miss out as well. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really important to be in the game when we have those good seasons because that's when we can make the big returns on some of these crops, particularly you know, when you do get seasons like 16 and 17 where we had uh, in some regions you know, reasonable yields and some very good prices at times. Uh, you can get some remarkable returns from chickpeas. Next slide, please. Just going to jump on to some disease management stuff that we've been doing uh, over the last couple of years. And this will just touch on a few things from varietal tolerance to some new products. And uh, just been working with Josh Fanning. He's the new pathologist here in Victoria uh, looking with pulses. So if you've got any samples, you've got any issues, then don't be afraid to send us in, to, in here in Horsham. Otherwise, samples in South Australia can be sent into Jenny Davidson and her team in Sardi. Uh, what we've been looking at is potential opportunities, and this graph hasn't come out very well, so you can't read all the products on the left-hand side on this particular display screen. But what we've been looking at is the opportunity to control disease both uh, post-infection and before infection. So before infection, we're using uh, products like your chloros, right down through to some of the new ones, Aviator, Veritas, etc. cetera. Um, and then obviously looking at the opportunities of some of those new products to control disease post-infection. So if we actually see disease and then respond to it. Um, but obviously this graph really highlights the fact that, you know, if we can keep the disease out, we generally don't see as many issues and we can keep it under control, particularly with varieties like PBA Striker which is the red bar there, you can see all the way along, we get quite significant levels of infection um, if we allow disease to get in before applying a fungicide seed treatment. We must note though, given the dry season, there were just no yield losses across the board with the particular treatments we were looking at. So um, yeah, it's just, we're gonna continue looking at some of these uh, newer products and the opportunities they provide to control Aspicida in chickpeas. Next slide, please. This will lead on into Christie's, and I'll just touch on this quickly. Back in 2016, that big photo there is just a highlight of what a trial site that I was running for Christie was uh, at Cario. Um, created a huge shock for me when you walk out there and you're going, oh boy, what's going on here? But there were lines that were surviving and um, Christie's done a fantastic job in responding to this. And there are actually lines coming through now with reasonable levels of resistance uh, that potentially could be released uh, this year. And um, we'll talk a little bit more, more about them in a few moments. But uh, yeah, there's certainly been a very rapid response from the breeding direction, but also from an agronomic management perspective. So. If we jump on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the varieties coming through, but we can talk about the, the uh, fungicides as well. So this is just some of the varietal opportunities and where we're looking at the percentage of uh, plot affected um, by Ascochyta blight. This is in unsprayed conditions at Horsham last year. So you've got a new newer breeding line uh, potential for release, size of 1454, which we only found about 10% infection from uh, Ascochyta last year. And that's pretty consistent over the last few years. It has showed up relatively lower um, levels of infection and potential yield benefits associated with that. Um, and we compare that to how that, which is the old really susceptible variety and Genesis 90 um, at much higher levels of infection. But even given all that, the level of resistance that we have now in Genesis 90, which we class as moderately susceptible to Ascochyta blight, we're well aware that we can control that with the fungicides that we've got out there now, whether it's uh, making sure we react early with chlorothanol, so getting in with those early sprays. <clears throat> and again, it's very regionally specific. So in the higher risk regions, uh, your Wimmeras and the medium to higher rainfall zones, obviously we want to be on to disease control a lot earlier because we just don't want it starting, particularly with the protective products like chlorothanol. Um, we don't really want to be getting it going underneath the canopy because it's very hard to pull back. 
Uh, but we have got alternative products on the market like your Aviator and Veritas now that uh, certainly are a lot stronger and more curative on Astrocyte of Light in chickpeas. So, uh, yeah, there's certainly some good ways of controlling the d disease and we know that we can successfully control it on a paddock scale. So, you know, it'll be exciting as a new um, variety is coming through with uh, improved resistance. But that doesn't mean we can't control the disease and make the most of our opportunities to grow the crop in these coming seasons. Next slide, please. So, look, 2009 considerations, obviously, Africa blight, we always need to be aware of of that one. Uh, you know, this season started off relatively dry, uh, so there are some regions obviously that had significant rainfall in December, but um, generally summer has been relatively dry for us, so that's something to keep in mind with growing chickpeas. But uh, yeah, disease is obviously something with chickpeas we always need to be aware of, and um, but I'm pretty confident we have management strategies in place at this point to be able to hold the disease. So going forward into the next slide. No major photos here, sorry. I don't have any photos of the herbicide damage. I wasn't able to pick them up quickly. But uh, obviously keeping an eye out for all the um, residues in previous seasons. So whether it's your group B history or group high history, uh, you know, chickpeas are sensitive to those particular products. And we may not necessarily see it too visually in symptoms. Uh, but you certainly can get significant effects from residues carrying forward and then even products applied uh, around sowing. So uh, even the registered products, your, your metribuzins and uh, balance and dion, all those sort of products, if we don't get our seeding depth right, etc., we can get some level of crop damage from those particular products. So it's just keeping that in mind and, and making sure we have a plan strategy which is uh, suitable for whatever region we're in. Uh, it's too hard in a short presentation like this to cover off all regions. One of the things I did want to highlight too with chickpeas is stored moisture. They really thrive when we've got stored moisture. So, um, you know, it would be great if we picked up uh, a couple of inches of rainfall right now because chickpeas would kick along nicely. There are certainly some areas I know in our southern Mallee which I'd be pretty confident growing chickpeas this year uh, because of the fact that we had significant rainfall in December. So there's a lot of stored moisture down there. Um, so provided we get you know, half decent rainfall through the break, then you know that those the water will catch up with each other and uh, we should be able to grow some good crops. And pricing, well, obviously, uh, we'll talk a bit about that um, later in this webinar. So we'll move on from this into the next one. So just in summary, keys to growing successful chickpeas, uh, paddock selection and management. So understanding your herbicide history is really, really critical. Choosing your soil types carefully. So like most pulses, chickpeas tend to prefer those uh, um, pH range of six to eight, eight and a half. So, uh, and do like the the loamy soils up to your black cracking clays um, and some of the sandy loams. So, they tend to prefer some of the better soils. <coughs> and you know, there are going to be some issues as we push them onto you know some of our sandier soils and even the heavier calcareous soils. Variety choice, uh, obviously. For us in many regions, Genesis 90 is still tends to be the variety of choice. But in individual regions, there certainly will be opportunities for other varieties. So some of the desis in the um, uh, in the lower rainfall zones and being able to mature a bit earlier, we're certainly aware of some growers that are able to even get them to mature early enough to crop top. So obviously that's an issue with chickpeas and obviously an issue with your paddock selection and uh, ensuring that you, you're not going to run into ryegrass issues growing your chickpea crop, because uh, obviously crop topping is a key thing as part of growing a pulse crop. So keep all those things in mind as you move forward this year. Seed dressings, we'd always recommend to protect chickpeas with a fungicide and insecticide seed dressing, and have your disease management strategy mapped out at the start of the season based on your region. So you know, make sure you've got enough chemical on hand to at least meet the minimum standard of your, your disease management strategy 
for a semi-normal season because uh, we don't want to be caught short when we want to get out there spraying uh, come the middle of the season. Pre-imagine herbicides, we've touched on them before, so, <clears throat> you know, plan very, very carefully. Seeding rates, uh, you know, it's worthwhile considering that, particularly if we're going to go into you know, larger cabooleys, we can back back our seeding rates a little bit down to 25 to 30 plants per square metre even. Uh, in many cases, 35 plants per square metre is going to be sufficient for most chickpea crops, particularly when we're on the slightly wider row spacings. And inoculants and nutrition, just quickly touch on that, just to keep it in mind. Inoculants are very important in areas, particularly for chickpeas, where you haven't grown chickpeas in the past. There obviously are some areas where chickpeas are being part of the rotation for a long period of time, and often you won't see a response to inoculation. But when you're moving on to some of the acid soils or more marginal soil types, even up onto some of the sands, uh, it's really worthwhile applying the appropriate inoculant. And ultimately, walking hand in hand with a good agronomist along your journey is really, really important. Um, and these photos highlight one of the other big things that benefits chickpeas, uh, residue, standing residue. I think I highlighted it in the last webinar around um, lentils, but light, light lentils, chickpeas benefit from uh, having stubble there. And we've certainly seen your benefits of that in order of that 20% or more from sowing into residue, whether it be standing or on the ground. Uh, my preference has always been standing, sowing in between the rows. But um, obviously that's not always an option, but having residue there is certainly very valuable. I might just tie it up there and I think we'll move on to Christy. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask Jason, don't forget to hit the speech bubble icon, which should be at the top of your screen now potentially, and type your questions in there. We're now going to get our next presenter up, which is Dr. Christy Hobson. And she's with New South Wales DPI based in Tamworth and is the National Chickpea Breeder for Pulse Breeders Australia. Christy's going to discuss varieties with us as well as breeding for chilling tolerance and herbicide tolerance. Your microphone is off. Christy, are you there? Yeah, I am. Thanks, Chris. Beautiful. Off you go. Excellent. So good afternoon everyone from Always Sunny Tamworth and if you want to shoot over to the next slide, thanks Bruce. Okay, so um, today I'm going to give you a quick um, update on some upcoming chickpea variety releases and as Prue alluded to, um, speak a bit about some chilling tolerance research and where things are at with our breeding program and also herbicide tolerance and our breeding effort in that space. Next slide please. Okay, so the first um, new variety I'm going to talk about is Sisa 1156. Um, it's a medium seed size Kabuli. Uh, the commercial partner for this one is Seednet um, and we're planning a spring release in 2019. The Ascochyta blight foliar rating, which will be confirmed on release for the south, is moderately susceptible, which is the same as Genesis 90. Um, although we certainly have seen um, evidence in trials where it has looked much better than Genesis 90, but we're conscious that the rating really needs to um, trigger a management response and at this stage it's the same as Genesis 90. For those of you who aren't in the GADC southern region, uh, we actually give different ratings now for the south and the north. Uh, so in the north against the um, isolates we've identified to date, um, this line's performing really well and, and currently has a positive resistance to moderately resistant rating to Ascochyta blight in the northern GRDC region. It's mid-flowering and has mid-maturity, quite similar to Genesis 90, and as I mentioned, a medium seed size. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's some seed size data just to show that point a bit more clearly. Uh, there's three sites here, Horsham in 2016, Melton in 2016, and obviously 2016 was quite a favourable year for seed size, being quite a long season and Wagga in 2017. Unfortunately, we didn't have any seed size data from the South Australia or Victoria for 2017. Going down the table, you've got the percentage of seed size that is 7 millimetres, 8 millimetres and 9 millimetres and a comparison at each of those sites between Sister 1156 and Genesis 90. And you can see there's a much greater proportion of 8 mil seed and likelihood of 9 mil seed in this line. Next slide, please. 
Now looking at yield performance. Now this is um, from the NVT Long Term Yield Reporter, which you can all access. However, you will not see unreleased lines until um, they're released and we and NVT make them public. But that will occur once the line um, is launched. So I encourage you to go back there in spring um, to look at it more closely for your particular region. So the zero line in the table represents the mean environment yield and any, any dots above that um, is a, a yield greater than the mean environment yield and dot below is a lower yield. The red line is Cycle 1156 and the green line Genesis 90. So you can see they yield quite similarly, um, but in those more favourable years, 2016 and 2017, there is a slight yield advantage, um, which is also quite encouraging because we know Ascocyte of Light was present in the Wimmera in those years at the site. Uh, the yellow line is Genesis Kelkey, so yield advantage is over the larger seeded Kabuli. Um, and the blue line is PBA Monarch, which has really um, succumbed to these new Ascocyte of Light isolates, and we can see quite a yield penalty um, where Ascocyte is present in that line. Next slide, please. The next one I'm going to talk about is Cyster 1352. So it's a, a large seed size Kabuli. Um, so here we're probably more, we are comparing more to Genesis Kelkey. The commercial partner for this line is PB Seed, but the release timing will be confirmed. Janine might be able to do that for us today. The Astrocyte of Light Folio rating for this one is actually MRMS at the moment, um, and that will be confirmed upon release um, in the south and an MR in the north. It's mid-flowering, which is earlier than Genesis Kelkey and has mid-maturity and a large seed size. Next slide, please. So here's the same site for the seed size distribution of Cyster 1352. In the 2016 sites, you'll notice um, that the seed distributions are quite similar between Cyster 1352 and Kelkey, particularly the uh, nine mil seed. Um, they actually swap over between the Horsham and Melton as to which line has the largest amount of nine mil seed. However, we, we feel we have increased the seed size through the pure seed process of this line. The 2017 Wagga site uses the same, use the same seed source as what we passed over to PB Seeds as the, uh, the commercial seed that will become the, the variety. And as you can see, there's a significant increase in the percentage of seven, uh, nine um, mil seed compared to Kelkey. Next slide, please. Now if we look at yield over in South Australia on the North York Peninsula, same style of graph, the red line now is size of 1352 and we're really comparing against another large seeded Kabuli, Genesis Kelkey. So yield, slight yield advantage over Genesis Kelkey um, in this environment, but certainly lower than uh, Genesis 90. So you want to, environments where you can maximise that seed size of this line um, is, is where we're really targeting for this particular variety. Next slide, please. Okay, before I move on to chilling, I'll just address some of the comments that um, Jason made. He, he mentioned the Kabuli size of 1454. It's a small seeded Kabuli and it's a couple of years behind um, 1156 and 1352, but it has performed consistently well against a range of different aggressive isolates around Australia for Ascocyte blight. And it's, it's sitting at an MR rating for um, a southern type Ascocyte of Light foliage rating at this point. Um, Jason also mentioned some of the desis um, with improved ASCO resistance that were identified at the Curio site in 2016. We've uh, crossed those into um, a range of different backgrounds um, and although those, those lines themselves probably won't progress to commercialisation, we're well advanced in um, producing those lines into um, our yield evaluation program and there'll certainly be a good number of those lines with that type of pedigree background in stage one this year. So moving on to chilling tolerance. Um, I think most of you, if you've experienced or grown chickpeas before, would be well aware that chickpeas are sensitive to cool temperatures, which don't necessarily have to be a frost. <coughs> Excuse me, where the average, so if we talk about the maximum temperature and the minimum temperature for a day, divide them by two, if that's less than 15 degrees, there's been um, many observations which cause flower and pod abortion under that type of temperature regime. New South Wales DPI and GRDC research has been examining um, some breeding material more closely um, and they have identified a number of lines um, which have set pods and one line in particular which was able to do this last year both at Tamworth and Wagga before, the, before 15 degrees was reached. 
There's also CSIRO, UWA and JDC investments which are looking for even improved chilling tolerance um, in our wild relatives of chickpea and we expect that will produce even higher levels of chilling tolerance. There's also quite a bit of work happening around identifying tools and controlled environment screening methods which will help us rapidly integrate um, the chilling tolerance trait into adapted backgrounds. Particularly uh, last year up in WA in the Minganu area where we avoided a lot of the frost that were occurring around the country everywhere else, there were a number of lines in stage two which significantly earlier pod set, um, which was really encouraging. These lines also have the interspecific background that the lines used in the research, um, so we're quite, quite confident that this material will um, be useful. Next slide please. So just a photo of, of some of this material um, in 2016, which, I, which was quite a cool spring, and this is up at Tamworth. Um, on the 14th of October, Hattrick was only just starting to flower, and the, in these, in this material was sown on the same day. Um, and then we've got one of these lines um, at the same day, which has already set seven pods. So these were, this was the sort of day that I got pretty excited that I felt like we are making inroads into this trait, um, and now we're examining it more closely. Next slide, please. And finally, I'm just going to touch on some herbicide tolerance, so novel herbicide tolerance work. Um, Asadi GRDC investment identified tolerance to group B um, and other chemistries in chickpeas. Um, that material was rapidly incorporated into the PBA chickpea program. Asadi also identified molecular tools which will allow us to track that trait really, really carefully into the breeding program and has allowed us to move quite rapidly um, in, in terms of integration of the trait. So this year we'll have advanced material in stage two trials and entries in MVT are expected next year for the group B chemistries. Um, and obviously the release of these lines is subject to the required chemical registration process. So obviously we've been a little bit behind the lentils in, in this area um, and I'm quite excited about being able to deliver some novel herbicide um, tolerance chemistry in chickpea and we feel like it will have a great impact in terms of um, farming systems and, and helping with that difficult task of weed management in the chickpea phase. So I think that's all I've got, Prue. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, let's tie up today's webinar with our final presentation, which will give us a look at what chickpea markets are doing. For that, I'd like to introduce Janine Sowness. Janine is the Commercial Manager at PB Seed, which is just near Horsham, and they specialise in the production of seed and grain processing and packaging through to marketing seed and grain domestically and internationally. Janine, I will turn your microphone on. Hello, thank you, Prue, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I'll be focusing today yeah, on Kabuli chickpea because we're um, southern region um, focus uh, where a lot of the Kabulis are really produced. Um, so firstly, just um, I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about supply. Uh, I'm going to talk, markets talk about supply and demand and in Australia, um, certainly the last few years have, we've had very high prices for um, Kabuli chickpeas, which has caused um, an increase in areas um, and certainly as a seed company over the last two years we've seen significant demand for seed. Um, we market the Genoti and the Kalki chickpeas and um, moved a lot of seed to Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales in the last two years and no doubt the Monarch has also now um, increased in area as well. Um, now as we all know we had a Tough year last year across many areas, um, and you know the dry um, caused its damage. But at the end of the year, certainly the frosts made major um, deterrents, uh, major yield problems um, in the in the region, and um, our yields were you know pretty low and under a ton per hectare in many areas. So um, just. Picking up on Christie's question about the um, seed increase of the large Kabuli, that the frost made a major, uh, was majorly detrimental to the seed increase, um, knocking the yield right back. So there really may not be enough yeah, enough seed for release of that this, this year, uh, considering the sort of quantity demand um, typically for the large um, genus, large chickpea. Um, so watch this space for when that's available. 
Um, the bit, I guess the biggest impact on the market in terms of the um, poor yields and dry season was the reduction in the percentage of um, the large size grain in the samples. Um, you know, typically say Gen 90 mate would have over 30% 8 mils, but we're certainly seeing a lot of samples where there's you know, under 10% 8 mils, so that's um, you know, quite a significant drop in size grain um, coming to the market. Um, so those the, the sizing makes a major um, impact on how that's priced. Um, there has been um, some old season supply still on farm, which um, was sort of coming out over the last few months. And um, the market's a little bit surprised it hadn't moved um, with the high prices previously, but, uh, but I'm not sure how much, the, what, what quantity that is that's there. Uh, so next slide, please, Prue. Okay, so moving on to sort of what's happened around the world um, in terms of supply and exports. Um, our major, other major competitors, exporting countries are India, Mexico, Canada and the US. And um, they're all growers are subject to the same, uh, look, looking forward to the high dollars and certainly increased areas um, in countries that are wanting to um, make, make, take advantage of the high prices. And, in Canada, the area last year more than doubled of uh, chickpeas, and in the US it was up over 30% higher, up to sort of record areas of plantings. Um, so there's sort of still certainly good stocks available around the world, um, and where we've seen it's led to sort of price drops um, last year. Um, looking forward um, in markets, there's um, I guess we're trying to see what's going to happen in India as the harvest comes up in the next few months. And at the moment, some of the Indian exporters are suggesting maybe that the production may not be as high as expected, but that's just a, until it happens, it happens. Um, and then there's other talk about there's possible shortage of the larger size in the market overall, um, in other countries as well. Um, and some countries are starting to look at higher prices, asking prices for the large nine mil sort of sizes, um, about, well above the um, smaller sizes. Just as an overlay, um, there's certainly a lot of an increasing demand in, in the Western world diets of uh, like Kabuli chickpeas being used in um, uh, new products. So we're not just going into traditional markets as we've had in the past. There's a lot of the Canadian uh, product would go is exported into the US at their top market, and um, the US certainly has been growing their chickpea area plus the demand. Um, the US really is a home of processed food, and the chickpea is an increasing ingredient into a number of food products in that country um, to to meet a very buoyant. Um, high sort of trending plant-based food product and vegan food market and gluten-free market. Um, there's all sorts of different products being developed and being sold that incorporate chickpeas such as you know, a whole range of things like high protein chickpea vegan ice cream and um, there's nut-free chickpea peanut butter, tastes like peanut butter but hasn't got any nuts in it. A lot of range of things that the US is sort of renowned to uh, produce. And, uh, but also that sort of traditional uses are increasing, that people are uh, enjoying uh, the hummus is an increasing product and falafel, um, certainly those sort of products are um, also become very popular in that market. So this is a, it's a, it's a high, a good quality product. So next slide please, Prince. So just to talk about locally, um, uh, PBCs, we're very involved in domestic um, demand as well and selling into the domestic market. Um, the export market is very flat at the moment, um, but we've experienced a lot of demand still locally. Um, and we've certainly been buying a lot of product um, to meet that need. Um, now, so Kabuli chickpeas certainly must be cleaned and sized um, based to where it then ends up in the market. Um, and a lot goes to food manufacturers who are making the hummus dips and falafel. Um, and they're very specific on their requirements, each particular company. Um, there's others going into prepackaged salads and meals, then put on supermarket shelf. Um, 
as well as the traditional just packaged, cleaned and packaged whole in small packs for supermarkets and wholesalers selling out to a range of um, buyers as well. So it's quite a multi-level leveled market locally. But it certainly demands then being going for high quality food that it's a very premium quality assured product. Um, and you know we have uh, third party quality assured systems to make sure everything's covered off to minimize contaminants. And from the time it comes from the farm truck, farm address to our, uh, where we inspect it, we uh, must meet all the quality standards and you need to minimize contaminants in the product. You know, for example, uh, if there's a bit a small amount of faba beans mixed, mixed in um, a chickpea sample, that's very detrimental to the production of hummus because the beans go very dark um, in the soaking in um, process. So uh, the, the food manufacturers don't like that at all. So we have to be very careful of any contaminants um, and have very strict allergen controls throughout the processing facility. Um, the supermarkets demand that that's managed at a high, very high level. Um, so need to make, make sure any contaminants such as cereal um, is very low, um, so our cleaning processes can eliminate that. But the hard, slightly harder one at times can be if there is lupin, which is a, an emerging allergen as well, that's now on the allergy list um, in the, over the last few years. So occasionally we've seen trucks of chickpeas out of the Mallee with a contaminant of lupin. So we have to make sure that's man, uh, cleaned and managed very well and segregated um, to what product um, uh, each market gets. So, I mean, lupin can clean very easily out of a nine mil size grade, but it can condense in a perhaps a seven mil size grade. So, those things need to be managed very carefully to meet these sort of market demands. Uh, next slide, please, Proof. So, just a bit of an update on some recent domestic pricings. Um, to meet the demand, we've been buying out of Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales, um, and sort of around the Genesis 90, around the $700 per tonne, um, but there's been higher levels of eight mils in the sample with um, certainly a higher price, maybe up to 780 we've done. Um, but it's very much buying on sample, priced on size percent because that's, you know, different markets require different sizes and we'll pay different levels for that. Um, and the larger Kabuli, such as the Monarch, Kalkis and Almers we've been buying, um, uh, if they're over 30%, nine mils up to 850 um, per tonne. Um, and a few months ago, it was up in the sort of $1,000 per tonne for the where there was a high percentage of nine mil in the sample. So um, the higher the great, higher the size, certainly the higher the price. So varieties that enable um, uh, inherently with a higher level of nine mils and larger size are certainly a lot more valuable. Um, the only other thing we're sort of looking at is potentially, um, since the mar export market's pretty flat, is to investigate any export opportunities to some of the premium markets that may take this sort of quality assured supermarket pr product and whether we can get different pricing compared to just bulk container markets um, to try and meet this increasing sort of food quality uh, grade in the market. So that sort of wraps, wraps it up a bit. Thank you, Prue and everyone. Thank you very much, Janine. So that wraps up the formal presentations for today. Um, we can now move into a Q&A. I haven't received any questions yet. I think uh, everyone's a little bit quiet compared to other webinars on a Friday. Um, but look, I've just popped up on your screen the chat box that, that you should see circled in red there. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think of some questions and type them in. While you're thinking and typing, um, if you are looking for further information on chickpeas, GRDC Grow Notes are an incredibly comprehensive resource and is accessible through the GRDC website. So that's an online uh, resource that covers the A to Z of growing chickpeas and everything in between and a lot of the work that you've heard about today will be included in there. Also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project, of which today's webinar is a part of, will be having a number of activities occurring through 2019 to continue bringing you the latest in pulse information. 
Um, we've just had a quick question come in. How do disease ratings compare to WA? Jason and Christy, I'll unmute you guys for that one. Do you want to have a go there, Christy, first? Yeah, I can. Um, so, um, from our from our um, from our observations of um, certainly we've seen ascochyta blight present in WA um, in commercial crops um, and in MVT trials, particularly um, around the Mullawa and Minganew area. Um, what we're seeing is that, and what work uh, Rebecca Ford has a project, um, she's based at Griffith University where they, um, I guess, isolates are received by her program and then she triages them based on their aggressiveness. Um, and the WA ones certainly aren't in the, to date, haven't been in the same level of aggressiveness as some of the Victorian and South Australian isolates. So some of the older type ratings probably hold. The breeding program's not doing any um, disease screening as such in WA, but that is being addressed by Curtin University um, this year actually. So it is a gap we're aware of um, and something that's, that is being addressed through some uh, field nurseries run by Curtin. I think Christy's covered it off quite well there. I don't really need to add anything. No worries. Thanks, Jason and Christy. Still got time for one or two more questions if you do want to type them in. Um, so just back to the other activities from the Southern Pulse Extension Project. We have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia which is targeted at uh, reasonably new pulse growers. If you are near one of the locations on your screen and you'd like to get involved, send me an email. My contact details will be at the end of the webinar and I'll get you in touch with the group coordinator. Uh, we'll also be having a series of crop walk at Southern Pulse Agronomy trial sites, so the sites that Jason had plenty of pictures of today, and that'll be happening right across the southern region in late winter and spring. Today, this webinar is the final of five that we've run this week for chickpea, lentil, faba bean, vetch and field pea. Um, if you would like to access recordings of any of the other pulse types, they will be on the GRDC website hopefully next week or you can flick me an email and we can get you a copy earlier. Um, if you did like the format today and the event, please let me know and feel free to suggest other pulse topics that you might like to cover off throughout the growing season so we can have in-depth conversations about a particular area. I haven't had any other questions come in at this stage, so what we might do is we'll wrap up. If you have any other suggestions or requests for things that you'd like to learn about pulses this year, please drop me a line anytime. My contact details are on the screen now. I'd like to give a great big thank you to Jason, Christy and Janine for their presentations and also to all of you for participating today and I hope that you all grow some really fantastic chickpea crops this season. Thank you very much. <laughs>